You're listening to a TVO podcast. The following podcast contains coarse language, descriptions of violence, and sensitive themes which may not be suitable for younger audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Previously, on Unascertained. They started struggling in the hall. He didn't want to go in the cell. And then that's when pepper spray was out and he was macing him in his face, eyes, mouth, nose, everything. Stomping his head. Wham, punched him. He had his knee on his neck every time they got on the ground, but the third time he couldn't get back up. There's a small percent of officers that are doing a lot of bad things. And we learned that when Kawartha Lakes Police Service went to interview him. I'm like, I'm not doing this film in custody. I'll help you when I get out. Two days before I got out, I read the guards were cleared of any wrongdoing. My question would be, what's the rush? not to charge someone. Now there's a break in the case. Ontario Provincial Police have reopened a case we first told you about two years ago. The case has now been reopened. Yeah, I've witnessed staff um, calling inmates, you know, derogatory terms. I found myself in a couple of situations that I was in disbelief of. Uh, Mind you, not everyone at that facility is racist. However, I walked by the staff room once and clear as day overheard somebody use the N-word. The voices you're hearing are current and former correctional staff from Ontario jails. After years of experiencing racism, witnessing the abuse of power and corruption, they became fed up and wanted to expose what was happening. One whistleblower recorded these calls with fellow correctional officers, managers, and sergeants and release them back in May of 2019. I feel that a lot of the bullying and harassment that I experienced were from the administration, from people who were my superiors. Uh, They're just like, well, I don't like this inmate, so I'm just going to throw something in his cell just to pretend that uh, I found it there and then we can put him in psych. When I tried to report something to the union, the union president said, if anybody witnesses anything, I'm going to find out and make your life hell at work. And I filed a complaint against him, and at that point he started suspending me every two weeks for absolutely no reason. Those complaints were going nowhere, and they were just being hidden, but at the same time I became a target, so it was, I was basically got pushed out by the superintendent. They would rather get rid of people with the blower than fix the damage because it's cheaper. Cheaper to get rid of me. The subculture is very negative, very toxic. I would describe it as a poisoned work environment. That whistleblower who recorded those phone calls was this man, Yosko Asenov. In May of 2019, he released a 17-minute video detailing his and his former colleagues' experiences with racism, corruption, and harassment in corrections. Corrections is a very challenging, very difficult job. You know, I think a lot of times, from what I've heard from society and people that talk to me, they think it's like, okay, it's a glorified babysitter. You know, it's a jail guard. They don't realize the challenges of that job. It's more than just feeding a guy and, you know, tossing him in a cell. Yosko was a correctional officer in Ontario for six years. In 2016, he resigned from his position due to the racism he experienced as a person of color. When he spoke out about what he went through, others followed. After watching Yosko's video, I reached out to him. I wanted to make sense of why the correctional officers in Suleiman's case made the decisions they made Because I couldn't speak to any of those officers, and also since their statements haven't been made public, I needed someone who could tell me what really goes on inside Ontario jails. But it's the entire subculture goes towards that mentality of us versus them. As we're in control, we're powerful. And unfortunately, the people that are kind of like running the show are the ones that are abusing people. I'm Yusuf Zin, and this is Unascertained. After the Kawartha Lakes Police investigation into Suleiman's death closed in 2017, an internal investigation by the Ontario Ministry of the Solicitor General took place. In the summer of 2018, it concluded. Shortly after, four Lindsay Jail staff were fired. Two captains, one deputy, and one officer. Several others also received 20-day suspensions. The local newspaper, the Peterborough Examiner, picked up the story on August 2, 2018. The article confirmed that the firings were, quote, in connection with Suleiman's death. In November of 2018, 
Ontario's chief coroner, Dr. Dirk Heyer, announced the investigation would be reopened and led by the Ontario Provincial Police due to new evidence. While that was underway, the Fakiri family also filed a civil lawsuit against the ministry and the correctional staff involved. On October 25th, 2019, they got a response. Two managers and one officer who were fired released a statement of defense. Here's what they said. They claimed that Suleiman's death was accidental, but if it was due to negligence, it was the ministry that should be held responsible, not them. They claimed the ministry failed to get Suleiman a psychiatric assessment, failed to deploy the crisis intervention team, and failed to properly train them with the use of handcuffs, spit hoods, and pepper spray. Ultimately, they felt that they were being used as scapegoats. Let's just assume Suleiman was being uh, aggressive and the guards used the force that they did uh, with the intent to defend themselves. Is there an argument there that they were defending themselves because they felt like their, their lives were in danger? They don't plead self-defense. Yeah. And the real question is, were they doing what they were trained to do and following the training correctly? That's Nader and Ted, the Fakiri family lawyers. And I think the answer is no, they were not doing what they were trained to do and that they were not following the training correctly. And one of the reasons I think that is because you don't fire people for following the training and carrying out the procedures correctly. So to answer your question, no, I don't think you get to get out of this by saying, we were just doing the best we could and we thought it was a tough situation. That's not how it works. So we know that four staff were fired and they're not saying they acted in self-defense. Rather, they say if they were negligent, they blame it on the ministry for not training them properly. And they're saying they were thrown under the bus. If that's the case, who is responsible? None of this comes as a surprise to Yosko Hesenov. There's no actual accountability. The staff know this is going on. They know who the people that are using excessive forces. They know who the people that are harassing and discriminating people. They know who those people are. The question is, why is nobody speaking out? Yosko Hesenov is 33 years old, with Bulgarian and Turkish parents. He has a calm, yet authoritative vibe about him. When we met him in his home, there were balloons and decorations from a baby shower the previous day. Yosko and his wife were expecting their first child. Growing up, I've kind of like fallen in love with the humanities field, with law enforcement, uh, social work, anything to do with just helping human beings and uh, diving into their psychology, into their the emotional side of really helping people and being connected to them. I went to University of Waterloo, I did criminology, uh, I kind of debated, like, do I want to go into law school? Do I want to go into uh, policing or corrections? I began to do some volunteer work for the ministry through probation and parole and uh, decided that one of the best ways to get into government and to have an opportunity at probation and parole would be to get into corrections. But his idealism was shattered almost immediately. Well, my first week there, senior union member comes up to me and says, this is a racist jail. Watch your back. I mean... He said that to you? Yeah. To my face, not just to me, but to another officer, a black officer as well. Like, I mean, we're looking at each other like, <laughs> what's going on here? Like, somebody with a position of authority that you would look up to and go to if you have any issues is telling you, watch your back, this place is racist. Black and Indigenous inmates are overrepresented in Canada's prison system. According to the John Howard Society of Canada in 2017, Black people were overrepresented in federal prisons by more than 300% versus their population, while for Indigenous people, the overrepresentation was nearly 500%. It was hard to find many statistics from Ontario jails, but it's clear the same disparities exist. A 2016 report on the Ontario bail system found that Indigenous peoples and people of colour are, quote, more likely to find themselves in pre-trial detention. That same year, in the Toronto South Detention Centre alone, 40% of inmates in segregation were black. For Yosko, he says he's experienced and witnessed racism in corrections firsthand. This is actually not covert, 
but over in your face racism. And this is happening out of all places in law enforcement, which is something that I truly believe should never happen in. So to me, perhaps I was very naive. I thought everybody should be upholding this badge. And then you get in there and the first week throws me off. I hear a black colleague talking about, you know, I was in the lunchroom and, you know, these guys are calling me the N word. I can clearly hear they're talking about me using my name. Then you hear about an officer that's now off on sick leave and, you know, her unborn daughter was being called the N word while she was pregnant and working here. She reported in management and nobody cared. Being called a monkey, being called a terrorist, you know, forcing me to strip search all the Muslim inmates because my manager assumed I was Muslim when I'm not. You're hearing these things, right? And you're working and you're trying to continue to be ambitious and continue to do good work. But in the background, I start thinking, how am I supposed to earn a paycheck, take that money home, feed myself, feed my family with that same money that's being earned through people abusing their power? And if they can do that to their own staff, what are they doing to other people, members of the public, the inmates? For Yosko, he believed that part of the problem was the training or lack thereof. Until 2020, to become a CO or correctional officer, you needed to attend a program called CODA, the Correctional Officer Training Assessment. It was a course that taught both the theory and practice of corrections. In order to enroll, you need to pay the thousand dollar admission fee and have a high school diploma. That's it. Potentially someone who's 18, high yeah. right out of high school could yeah. become a CO. Well, that's the thing. I've worked with people that are 21 years old. 20 years old, right? And they're at the police college and they're training. You know, like the police officer will have their training, their one year of training, and they'll go around on uh, ride-alongs and all the stuff and be able to have like a, usually a manager or somebody that's a, a, a training officer, if not manager, but at least somebody with a lot more experience that's training people. In corrections, you don't have that. For Yosko, the program took 13 weeks, but over the years, it was eventually reduced to eight weeks. I personally think it should be a lot longer than that. I think they don't dive into things as much as they should have. It was very general knowledge. It was like literally like small course on Aboriginal studies and human rights, you know, workplace discrimination, harassment policy, and you know, very, very quick courses. And the majority of the rest of the time was on the physical part, on the use of force, on the defensive tactics, because we have to know both the written component of, you know, how to use your OC spray and your handcuffs and also be able to apply it physically. So the majority of our training was focused on that. Was there any training yet for dealing with an inmate with mental health uh, illness? No. When we did our scenario training, it would be scenario training of an unruly offender, somebody who's, you know, in a, in a cell, they don't want to come out or they're refusing orders. Well, that's not the same thing as dealing with schizophrenia, dealing with bipolar, dealing with somebody with depression, dealing with somebody with suicidal ideation. What is the understanding of what those look like? And then how do you deal with that? But I don't remember ever doing any kind of mental health specific training. In January 2020, the Ministry of the Solicitor General announced that they were replacing the CODA program with a new curriculum. It's now called the Corrections Foundational Training. This time, it has more of an emphasis on human rights, de-escalation, and mental health. But there were still things Yosko felt like were not being taught to new recruits. How do you go home to your family after you've seen death? You know, how do you deal with sexual assault, sexual abuse in the workplace with inmate on inmate, or abuse with staff on inmate? Seeing that and then going home, how do you deal with that? That none of that is ever not, addressed. Not once was that addressed. Looking back at your experience, mm. in hindsight, would you say that you were properly trained and you were it prepared you? Absolutely not. No. Not at all. I was surprised at the lack of training Yosko received. And I'm not kidding myself thinking jails are havens for rehabilitation. But from what Yosko described, it didn't seem like a healthy environment for inmates or staff. Like when you're thinking about the word corrections, the word correct is in corrections. So what are we correcting? I mean, in many ways, a lot of people have a positive mindset going in and they want to make a difference. And I've seen it with a brand new officer shaking hands with an inmate, helping him read if he can't read, reading his probation order, telling him where to be. Three months later, he's calling everybody cockroaches and pieces of crap. And this is what surprised Yosko the most. It wasn't just those who were locked up that he had to worry about. We call it the three-headed monster. You have the inmates, 
you have the other officers and you have the management. There's a huge issue with the work culture in terms of toxicity. What I mean by toxicity is like things that would never fly anywhere in any other private sector job, or even if they did, somebody would be held accountable. Somebody would be at least at the very least investigated. Go on. It's not just pervasive. It is literally perpetuated by the same people that you don't even expect to perpetuate these things. So sexual harassment to female colleagues, mocking gay people, racially abusing inmates, racially abusing other staff, corruption, you know, abuse of power, excessive use of force. Yosko told me this story about an experience he had with an inmate one evening, something that he'd never forget. An inmate that ended up somebody that I talked to all the time on my unit and somebody that I, I could feel for the most part. He was kind of a very mellow guy and very soft-spoken to begin with, but I could tell that he was not himself. I could tell that something was off. He was very depressed. And one shift, I'm working night shift, and late in the evening, I'm doing my rounds, I'm doing my checks, I'm looking inside cells, and I walk by him and he's got a bed sheet and he's trying to, he's trying to take his life. So in that situation specifically, I asked for support, like I called a medical alarm, other staff began to come into the unit, I opened up his cell, helped him out of it, and he's on the floor. And you know, I can't forget like the look on somebody's eyes when they're like trying to take their life, and it didn't happen. It's a weird feeling, you know? So. You know, he falls to the floor and I'm kind of holding him down. I'm starting to talk to him. And a couple of the guys come in, some bigger guys, bigger CEOs, push me out of the way. And for no, re no reason at all, just jack this guy's arms up, pull out pepper spray, handcuff this guy to the rear, grab him and drag him into SAG. Like the guy literally just tried to kill himself and we're dragging him to SAG. And it actually caused me a lot of like trauma in a sense, right? Not so much because I saw this guy trying to kill himself, but the way that they use force it's so inhumane. It's like, this guy's already vulnerable. He's already on the floor. He's crying. What's the sense in jacking his arms up and using aggressive force and lifting him up? It's that, that kind of stuff that I see also as, like a, as a problem. And how do you account for that? They don't care. The guys that were in the cell did not care. And, and the thing is, it's not like anybody talked to the guy. They literally chucked him in the cell, told me to write a report. That's it. So I want to walk you through um, what happened that day. Mm -hmm. or, or... Yosko agreed to hear the timeline of Suleiman's death and point out any red flags he noticed. We decided to stick to the timeline from the official Kawartha Lakes police report, and we set aside John Thibault's eyewitness testimony. I wanted to know if Yosko only had the facts the police had, would he notice any irregularities? I started with the shower incident on December 15th. After Suleiman refused to leave the showers, a psychologist arrived and calmed him down. I can tell you guys, like, I'm actually shocked that a psychologist came. But the fact that they called a psychologist point, points... Points out. that they recognize that this guy has some major distress going on in his life and some concerns of mental health. Um, you know, to put it simply, they need support ASAP. Suleiman's hands were cuffed to the front through the shower door hatch, and he was left in that position for approximately one minute. So you can tell if somebody is handcuffed somebody to the front, that means that they're compliant and that you have no worries really that they're gonna hurt you. If they're to the rear, you only do that when uh, somebody's a danger and you fear that they're gonna assault other people. During that time, staff discussed whether they should escort Suleiman to his cell. So generally speaking, I would say, okay, he's locked in, you know, like let's, let's figure it out. If we don't have the staff to be able to move this guy or we think that he's a threat, then obviously you're going to consult with the manager, right? Because the manager needs to manage the situation and act on this. What do you want us to do? Do you want the ISA team called? Okay, then they make that decision. So again, that's the way it's supposed to work. The request for the crisis intervention team, or ICIT, to take over the situation was denied. The officers were advised to try and continue to manage Suleiman by themselves. So now you have no backup, no witnesses, no cameras really on you, no, nobody else to support you. So now that's a potential for use of force or nobody would have seen it. Sully was escorted down the hall to his cell by five correctional officers. A sixth guard joined and this seemed to escalate Suleiman's behavior. Suleiman started resisting the efforts of the guards and spat in the direction of one of them. 
Now, spitting on somebody is looked at as a very degrading thing and very much in corrections. My experience is whenever somebody spat on somebody, people have taken that situation a lot more serious with that inmate and have been quicker to respond or there's a genuine disregard for that person at that point. So is it possible that could have been the maybe the, the yeah. per emotional trigger for that guard? To yeah, his? absolutely. Absolutely. And, and again, if, if one person starts striking, other people start thinking that that's okay as well and they follow suit because that person is doing it, it's groupthink. After the spit, one officer attempted to give Suleiman an open-handed strike, but missed. open hand strike, yeah. Is that why? why I just, um, <laughs> open-hand strike is something that you get told to write. It's, it's something that happens, like it's this, right? It's this motion of, of forward motion where you're literally hitting somebody with like your palm, the bottom of your palm with your fingertips up. But they tell you to do that so that you're not creating bruising and cutting and that kind of thing. When you're doing use of force, you're taught to do only one level above the necessary use of force that you need for that particular situation. And as soon as that person's handcuffed, it's done. It's simple as that. But I just kind of laugh because a lot of time in reports, they would write things that are terminology that's used in the defensive tactics training, but that's not actually what happens. Open hand strike, when you're saying that, that's very vague. That's very open for interpretation. It could be a push. It could be a push. It could be a punch. What exactly is that and how did you do that? You know, and why? What was the reasoning for you to do that? Right after he was pepper sprayed. Um, and again, this is still them trying to get him into the cell because he's resisting. Does that seem like uh, the proper course of action? If you have an inmate who you're trying to get in there and he's, he's pushing back. Yeah, I mean, yeah. pepper spraying is seen as, in defensive tactics, the least intrusive way. You're not using a baton. You're not striking people across the face or across the, the legs or anything like that. You're not punching and kicking them. You're pepper spraying them. In a, in a sense, it keeps you safe. It keeps them safe. They're far enough away. Generally speaking, very few people have any issues with pepper spray. It's pretty safe. You would just have to decontaminate their eyes after. But you spray for, from a couple of feet away, and that allows for you to be able to then go and take control and handcuff them and get them to comply. Once inside the cell, officers got Suleiman to the ground while he tried to get up. They delivered body strikes that ground Suleiman, while one officer kneed him in the back. A code blue was eventually called which is an emergency call for any available correctional officers to come help. We don't know the exact time of when the code blue was called. All we know is that it didn't happen until a few minutes after they entered the cell. That's, that's crazy to me. Why? You're supposed to call a code blue right away? Right away. Right away. You just do it on your radio or somebody else will call it. I mean, everybody has a radio for, for that reason. But you can also, um, there's, a, there's, there's things that we wear for like emergencies. Like you can literally pull it. And um, that'll call in the system. The system will see that, you know, code blue, somebody's in need. And that's within 30 seconds. So it's just like... That's what it's supposed to look like. All hands on deck. All hands on deck to support. Whoever can come, can come, and then most people will. Hearing this reminded me of something John Thibault said about the code blue in his interview. She had the, mic, the radio in her hand and was already asking, I'm going to call it, should I call it, should I call it? And the guy guards kept telling her no. Don't call it. Don't call it yet. They always call. I've seen them call Code Blue over nothing. When you got 30, 40 guards from all over the jail, if a guy's even thinking about fighting back, he's going to stop. So why wouldn't they call Code Blue right away? Like generally speaking, the moment that we have a combative inmate, I've always called Code Blue, and that's usually what's happened. So then why would it take... I have no nice idea time. about that. I have no idea. The police report said that when the officers exited the cell, Suleiman was left face down on his stomach, ankles bound by leg irons, and his hands cuffed behind his back. In the police report, there were references to the phrase hog tying. That's where your hands are tied behind your back and bound to your feet while you're lying on your stomach. We don't know if that's what happened to Suleiman. The coroner's report says that witnesses deny that he was hog tied. But the police report says at one point, his legs were crossed and pushed up to his buttocks. The police also found a nurse's note in the cell with the words, quote, hogtied him with a question mark. What wasn't found in the cell when the police arrived were the restraints used on Suleiman. In an email found in the police report, a few Kawartha Lakes investigators were tasked to locate them, and we don't know if they ever did. Whether Suleiman was hogtied or not, 
that still doesn't change the fact that being restrained on your stomach is something the ministry warns against. So he was face down he with was his face hands. Down. His hands still uh, tied from the back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just thrown off by the, like leaving somebody face down and handcuffed to the rear. Why? I mean, especially if this guy's having like breathing issues, right? Like, I mean, he's probably exhausted fighting. Just, it is not easy being in these situations, right? So I, I know from the officer standpoint, I get where they're coming from. I understand like what has to happen and you have to uh, maintain control and you have a big guy and who knows, right? There could be a couple small officers that are dealing with him. So I, I can understand. I understand the pepper spraying. I understand like, you know, if they had to use force, you cannot leave somebody like that face down with their hands in the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that just, that part shocks me. So what's what stands out for you about this is the fact that he was le lying left down on his on his yeah. stomach. Yeah. Whereas like you know, I, I just can't imagine like why you would leave somebody face down. I went looking in the ministry policies and procedures manual for any references to the positions used to subdue an inmate. I did find something linked to the use of a spit hood. A spit hood is a device made out of mesh fabric that slips over your head with an elastic band around your neck. This prevents spitting, biting, and spreading diseases. The police report states that a spit hood was placed on Suleiman after he was pepper sprayed and while he was on his stomach. You're still able to breathe in it. You're still able to breathe. It, it might be more yeah. difficult, that's for sure. That's for sure. It's more difficult to breathe in. And that's why I was surprised, like if they left him face down with a spit hood on and uh, like handcuffed to the rear, like, you know, and, and if people walk away from that cell even, that's, that's, a, that's a difficult thing, right? The policies clearly state that while an inmate is wearing a spit hood, staff must ensure that they are not placed on their stomach, they are never left unattended, and if they have been pepper sprayed, their eyes must be decontaminated. Decontaminated. What, what does that mean? It just means like you're running water through their eyes so that they can get the, the, the pepper fragments out. Usually speaking, like we've tried to get somebody decontaminated soon after, right? Because it, it's a it's burning and it's painful for them. And once they comply, you might be able to. But it all depends on their behavior, right? I didn't read anything in the police report about Suleiman's eyes being decontaminated after he was pepper sprayed. And according to John T. Bow, it wasn't just the eyes. It was his face, mouth, and nose. But it is policy to decontaminate, quote, as soon as feasible. However, the officers may not have been able to do that in the midst of the struggle. But once the decision was made to place a spit hood on Suleiman's head without decontaminating, the policy was broken. Oh, and if the inmate is experiencing a psychotic episode, the spit hood can increase those symptoms. This thing is no joke. According to the manual, the application of a spit hood is considered a use of force. It exacerbates that situation more, I would say, with a spit shield and face down, like so much more. I mean, anybody who's ever been face down and if you put your hands behind your back and you're trying to breathe is difficult enough. The police's timeline we shared with Yosko Asenov didn't include anything about an assault. So I finally told him about John Thibault's eyewitness testimony to hear what he made of it. I mean, it sounds like it was very intense and it sounds like they did not have a good grip on the situation at all. And they probably should never have moved him to begin with. Um, it's not at all uncommon or implausible for me to think that officers were striking him to get him to comply. But that doesn't excuse the right to start striking people. You're literally trained not to do that. Unless you're being rushed by their inmates, you're outnumbering them every time. So there's, there's really no real justification, especially once they get to the ground, where you're able to control them. It's not like you just get in this kind of drunk rage where you just start kicking and punching. Well, if you do, you don't belong there. I mean, like that's, um, that's, you belong in orange at that point, right? What difference is that between the crime that other people have committed? It's the same thing. Everything Yosko told me made me think was any of this related to why those staff were fired back in 2018? And if so, why haven't we heard anything about it? Well, you won't hear about it, right? Like, who's going to really stand up and talk about it? They risk their own job, their own reputation, their own safety by doing that. Is it different in every jail? You know, I can't speak for all jails. I definitely will not do that. But from my experience, a lot of people were connected. Managers, people's nephews, uh, family. 
Uh, managers are like husband and wife. People are connected and have a vested interest in protecting other people. And those same people that are abusing other people or that are creating the toxic work environment that I'm talking about are the same ones that are protected. And that is the number one thing that I want people to understand. That is the biggest issue for corrections is the code of silence and conforming. Can you explain what, what that is? It just basically means like you don't snitch on each other. It's a brotherhood and you protect your brothers and sisters. You do what's best for each other. That's really what it is. No matter what, no matter what you see. Yeah, no matter what, no matter what, really, right? You gotta remember too, these officers become friends. They go to each other's barbecues. They become more than just colleagues. They become a family. And when you add any time where you're protecting each other through assaults, through serious things, that builds that bond, right? That builds that solidarity. For Yosko, it was clear what needed to change in corrections. Make it okay for officers to speak up. Change that snitch culture, right? Like that rat culture that we have. It is not being a snitch. It is not ratting on anybody. That, is, to me, is the very definition of having the badge, is going against all odds and doing the difficult work of going against the subculture and staying true to that oath that you took when you had the badge. After six years of what he says was continued harassment and discrimination, Yosko finally had enough. It was not an easy choice at all. <laughs> I think very few people would leave a 100K a year job, right? Yeah. Like six-figure salary. And especially when you have your own office area to work in. And But do I even believe in this? Like, what was my mission to begin with going into the police college and going into corrections was to correct, to help people. So am I part of the change or am I part of the problem by staying here? After speaking with Yosko, it was clear there were a lot of red flags in the handling of Suleiman, and it's likely that some of the correctional officer's decisions played a part in his death. Then when you hear John Thibault's eyewitness testimony and evaluate the policies and protocols, it may answer why the Ontario chief coroner wanted a second investigation. Perhaps they also found some of the same red flags in the case. There was a lot of hope from the Fikiri family and their lawyers that this new investigation would provide some answers. But on August 5th, 2020, the news hit. We have an update now to a case we've been following. A second investigation into Fikiri's death has now concluded after reaching the same conclusion as the first. No evidence to substantiate criminal charges against any of the guards who restrained and allegedly beat Fakiri prior to his death. After a nearly two-year investigation, the OPP found no one criminally responsible for Suleiman Fakiri's death. They came to the same conclusion as the local police investigation. And the forensic pathologist who made the first report didn't change their opinion on the cause of death, meaning that it remained unascertained. Yusuf Fakiri, Suleiman's brother, attended a meeting with the OPP, and this is what he was told. We cannot press charges, even though they admitted that the eyewitness was credible. He's talking about John Thibault. Kortha Lake's police never interviewed him, but the OPP did. This is their words, not for me. The eyewitness is credible, but they say that we cannot press charges because we don't know who gave the fatal blow. I mean, what a preposterous and a ridiculous statement. Uh, we left the meeting with more questions than answers. I reached out to the OPP. They said they cannot speak about the specifics of an investigation to protect the integrity of any ensuing court processes, including a pending coroner's inquest. Ultimately, they said the Crown determined that there was no reasonable prospect of conviction based on the evidence in this matter. That's a fake argument. I don't think it's real. I don't think it's convincing. Clayton Ruby is one of the top criminal and constitutional lawyers in Canada. He's been involved in several high-profile cases, including many of those who were wrongly convicted. I met with him in the spacious backyard of his downtown Toronto home. I wanted to know what his opinion was on this news. That the decision was inexplicable. It is not the law in Canada that if all the criminals keep their mouth shut, you can't figure out what each one of them did, that they all go free. Rather, the law of aiding and abetting sets in. Even if you know that one person committed a fatal blow and you can't tell who it is, each and every one of them are aiding and abetting the principal actor. Each one of them is a jail guard. 
a peace officer under our law with powers and duties given by statute. And the most principal of those duties is to safeguard those in your charge. The prisoner was not free to leave the cell and seek help. He was not free to call a doctor and say, I need medical attention. It was their duty to do that. They failed in that statutory duty miserably. That's the crime of criminal negligence causing death or criminal negligence causing bodily harm. It is an aggravated assault as well. Both extremely serious offenses, punishable by many, many years in prison. According to the Federal Criminal Code, aggravated assault carries a maximum sentence of 14 years, whereas criminal negligence causing death is life in prison. In the criminal law, you don't have to prove that a blow, for example, was the cause of death in the sense of that's what did it. That's an entirely different reason why this result is inexplicable. And so in, in a sense, who gave the final blow doesn't really matter. There are cases in which it would matter. If you were trying to show a first degree murder by virtue of which requires planning and deliberation by the individual who struck the blow, then yes, it matters. But from almost all other crimes, it does not matter. And you have to be sort of an idiot to say he's got bruises all over his body and cuts, but that had nothing to do with the death. You don't have to have a scientific opinion that blow X was the sole cause of death. Clayton told me that if you're what's called party to the offense, everyone gets slapped with the same charge, even if you didn't strike any blows. Otherwise, gang violence would not be prosecuted in Canada. It is elementary and fundamental. Police charging correctional officers when someone is killed in jail isn't common, but it's not unheard of either. For example, on March 6, 2020, five correctional officers were charged with aggravated assault on an inmate at the Toronto South Detention Center. And then again, on December 22, 2020, 10 correctional officers were charged with crimes ranging from manslaughter to criminal negligence causing death at a St. John's jail in Newfoundland. So why was this case any different? There are lots of cases where people, or medical science cannot afterwards uh, discern the cause of death. And people do expire for no reason other than stress. Clayton's opinion was clear. But if the stress of the beating caused the death, there's no mystery to it. You've interfered with somebody's bodily and emotional harm. Uh, you've committed a crime, in my view. And then there's the testimony of John Thibault, the eyewitness. If the OPP found him credible, why not lay charges? Did there need to be more eyewitnesses? It's rare that you have more than one eyewitness. But having one witness makes it a good case. And you have a relatively strong case with an eyewitness. Many, many cases are successfully prosecuted with no eyewitness. I guess what, the reason why we're all here upset about this is because but we expect the system to work. Here, the system just didn't work. And that's why it's upsetting. There's nothing wrong with this system, but it's supposed to work and it didn't. For most of this investigation, I've been focused on this idea of the fatal blow. Who was responsible for the strike that ultimately killed Suleiman? But if Clayton Ruby is saying that it doesn't necessarily matter who, then why wasn't anyone held responsible? But then I wondered, maybe this whole time I was looking in the wrong direction. Perhaps the question wasn't who gave the fatal blow, but what was the fatal blow? And there was one last piece of evidence that could help answer that. Floor of a jail cell. Newly filed court documents suggest that the guards who were restraining him in his final moments violated the use of force rules set out in their training. Next time on Unascertained. That there's no law enforcement agency in the world that cannot be aware that that is a highly risky position to be in. Unascertained is written and produced by me, Yusuf Zin, and Kevin Young. Kevin Young is also our audio engineer. Our story editor is Michelle Shepard. Our intern is Selena Gallardo. 
Our legal counsel is Willa Marcus. Katie O'Connor is our producer for TVO Podcasts. The executive producer of Digital for TVO is Lori Few. The executive for Current Affairs and Documentaries for TVO is John Ferry. Theme song and music by Blue Dot Sessions. Unascertained is produced by Innerspeak and TVO.